<laughs> so much fun. Ooh, Hello, okay. everybody. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> oh, my speaker. Oh. Wow. So wonderful. So just to remind everyone before Steve gets started that for the folks who are doing the weekend retreat, this is a regular Sunday sitting. It's also more open to the public. So you'll see other folks who haven't been with us this weekend. And for folks who are joining just for the Sunday sitting to know that there are uh, a lot of folks here who are you know, sitting through the weekend. Some have been sitting for 10 days, some who will be sitting ongoing um, through the month. So we have a wide range of yogi, yogi land the many, <laughs> many flavors and uh, contours of Yogi Land with us today. All right, Steve, whenever you're ready, we can go forth. Noticing how awareness is holding our body posture just now. How, how is it holding it in a felt sense awareness? There's the, the, the silent stream of, of awareness itself, awareness that's before it goes into commentary or discursion or analysis, that very quiet stream, bare awareness, holding the body as we are sitting or standing or kneeling or lying. For this sitting, perhaps calling up uh, an intention it is a the the motivation for this particular sitting. Like resting in the pure silent stream that silent stream of awareness using the body as an anchor or the breath the sensations within the breath as an anchor knowing these anchors the posture and the felt sense of bodily nature known from within the posture, not filtered through the head, through thoughts, through concepts. It's that direct abiding in awareness of the felt sense of the body. An intention or motivation can be simply that restful, wordless abiding. That's feeling the moment to moment nature. of the body sensations, the elemental nature as they express in textures, 
movement, pressures, vibrations, temperatures. If you notice areas of hardness here, can you notice other areas of softness also here? And areas where you feel a tension or a pressure. Do you find other areas of lightness, sensations of subtle plates of vibration or points? Always there's that total receptivity and sensitivity of the hands as an anchor, as a touch point. So often in this lineage, an instruction would be to feel the whole body, a global awareness of the body from within and around the body. And then every few moments or minute or two to anchor on the touchstone of your of one's hands the hands may be touching each other or they may be resting on your knees or some part of your leg sit bones can be a touch point too where we just abide feeling those sensations. If we're sitting, it's likely to be pressure and tension, heat, hardness, many variations of vibration, pulsating. Just noticing, receiving, feeling, sensing. having the energy, calling up the energy to sustain this kind of, of preconceptual awareness. That it's actually more restful than, than entering the thought formations that describe experience or analyze experience or comment on experience. When we do that and, and stop, Often we notice it's, it's tiring to do that. Following thoughts often pulls us into this sense of someone observing. So there's an analyzer or commentator and it becomes conceptual with the identification. And then without it, there's just this restful interest and this freed up energy that helps the, the continuation of leaning back and letting that silent awareness move on its own, feel the body, go to the touchstone, the hands or the sit bones are the, the anchoring of feeling the breath sensations from within the moving breath, that expansion, contraction, that filling up, rising, series of sensations, hitting a peak of momentum, pressure, propulsion, and then a whole different set of relaxation, collapsing, softening, 
lighter, subtler sensations, most escaping our attention. Uh, so when it, the breath is fully out, expelled, easy for thought formations to arise, that's the perfect time to alight our silent awareness on the touchstone of the hands or the sit bones. Depending on where you are, where, where you are right now, your sitting space is like, might be certain sound vibrations that one can anchor our awareness on as they're felt, as the sound vibrations are felt entering the body. At first, maybe just experienced at the ear door, receptivity. The more quiet we are, sometimes we feel the sound by vibrations around the chitta, the solar plexus, the heart, mind center. We're hearing consciousness actually arises. included in having an, an intention or motivation for this sitting, we could call up the quality of compassion, the caring, the caring emotion, karuna, as a companion or an, an infusion to the silent awareness. So just as energy can be with the awareness and collectedness or concentration can be with the awareness, so too can the kindness of metta or this weekend with our weekend and month-long yogis were calling up compassion as the primary meditation. In the, in the Vipassana, we can also call up the compassion as a companion to this silent stream of insight awareness. This has a softening effect, a caring effect. So whatever the silent awareness alights in the moment with the, when experience arises, whatever is felt, the elemental nature of the body as an anchor or the breath as an anchor, or various mental states that arise, calm, disturbance, anxiety, relaxation, courage. It's noticed with the silent awareness and that softness of, of caring, whether the state is a difficult one of the fear or anxiety, doubt, or a state of confidence, courage, serenity. This silent awareness it's itself has no agenda, has no preference that there be serenity and not anxiety, that there be confidence and not doubt. It 
the awareness just arises together in the moment with these qualities, whether they're considered favorable, likable, like confidence and courage, serenity, calm, concentration, or whether they're disturbing moments of anxiety, fear, despair, depression. The refuge of true mindfulness is not pushing away the unfavorable and trying to gather and cling to the favorable qualities. And therefore the energy that comes along with mindfulness is that courageous Dhamma energy and the absence of ill will and the absence of sort of punishing judgments is actually compassion. The companion of care, mindful, caring awareness, compassionate awareness. All the while just being with the body elements as they are, as they're arising, the mental, emotional field as it is, with whatever's blooming, bright, new, fresh blooms, or fading blooms. Smooth fields, swampy fields. It's this caring awareness. Notice the agendas when they come, notice the wanting mind, wanting to control or manipulate, and feel the, how wearing, how tiring they can be, those states. Realize the moments that we're aware and the moments that we're caring those states fall away. There's no support for their proliferation to continue. And peace comes naturally, not through efforting, not through struggle. Everything we need to know arises from nature, the intelligence of bodily nature, and the intelligence, the deeper intelligence of our emotional nature, and particularly the liberating qualities like the Brahma Viharas. So if we've, if we've called up compassion, we feel its softness together with its sweet nature of not resisting, not denying, not backing off, even when there is resistance that's present, that's arising. The boundless nature of this compassionate awareness can hold anything and everything as it is.
sorry, friends. I just, um, you know, we have one of these, a subscription so that we can host up to 500 people and it, um, something happened. It, was, it wasn't functioning. So I just had to go try to put it on because people weren't able to get into the meeting. Um, hopefully they can watch on Facebook. Though now it looks like there's 101, so maybe I worked it. Uh, <clears throat> Duka. Maybe I'll just write a quick note here to folks if they're just joining. Yeah. You have um, heard from us for sure. Uh, if you've sat with us much, this quotation from the Visuddhi Maga that uh, it's overwhelm in the face of suffering that is the proximate cause for the arisal of compassion. It's a beautiful notion. Um, the idea that upon the encounter with suffering, our own or that of others, um, the overwhelm that one feels with that, the idea that there would be a, a natural inclination towards caring about that pain, caring about that hardship and about that suffering, the, the aspiration to alleviate it. And I, I think part of why it's so powerful uh, a notion when we first hear it or hear it again and are reminded of it is, is how much we also know the opposite to be true, that it's overwhelm in the face of suffering that also is the cause for the arisal of greed, hatred, and delusion. you could really very easily say that it's overwhelm in the face of suffering that is the cause for the arisal of the sense of self, right? The sense of self really being the, the result of craving anger, ignorance, right? That without these things, the sense of self actually does not arise or not arise very strongly but it's the contraction of the heart around pleasant experience or against neutral, ex against painful experience or fantasizing as a defense. All of those sort of movements of the mind, the contractions, the views, the, the fixedness, the rigidity that create that sense of me most clearly, most directly, most strongly are a result of the impermanent undependable nature of reality, right? That, that nothing is fixed, everything is changing, everything is, you know, pleasant experience dissipates. We are joined with the unpleasant. We cannot get what we want always. Um, we are bombarded with this, that there is a fundamental quality of dukkha at the heart of existence that all of these things function to create a defense for, a defense against, gives us a sense of stability if we can cling on to pleasure, if we can uh, reject that which might feel like it's threatening, um, that feels safer, you know, or it feels safer to just, the, the anger, the worry, the anxiety, the sadness, the craving, all of these things 
give us a sense of solidity actually right it's a the solidity that comes out of tension it's like the surface tension of the water it starts to create a boundary between us and the world even if it's fabricated how real it feels and to understand that that is a our system's defense learned habitual encouraged defense you know over many 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 years many lifetimes many modes of existence and I think at this point, most islands in Hawaii, they we have different problems with different um, invasive species, <clears throat> but there's no island that has no problem. And uh, one of them are these wild goats uh, brought to the islands many, <clears throat> many, many years ago. And they, at some point got to roaming around. There's wild pigs that are a problem. There's wild sheep that are a problem. There's all kinds of wild cats, feral cats, and um, all kinds of creatures that cause trouble. But these goats, they wander around the sort of dry landscape on this side of the island. It's like you, you can drive by them and you just can't believe how they survive in this arid uh, terrain of just ruggedness. And they look so rugged, you know, they're very kind of bony and scrawny and wild looking, you know. But they're also very destructive, especially for native plants, you know, that are unprotected out on the hillside. So anyway, short story is they've been, they've, the last few years they've protected an area uh, around us here. But what that's done is driven them around. And, and uh, in the last couple of weeks, we noticed them coming up the gulch here. It's a sort of first way that they can kind of start to get back up the mountain. And it's an interesting to watch that process of like, oh, seeing these wild beings, you know, coming through and at first mostly gnawing away other, these weeds, halicoa, really super invasive, very destructive, annoying plant. And these things, it's one of their probably primary diets, you know, so uh, that part it's like, oh, all right, well, these goats are helping get rid of something that's a problem and and then you see more and more of them. <laughs> and you have the sense they're lingering. And you know that, of course, here, once you get that, that boundary between uh, well, the wilderness and human culture, is there's much tastier things, you'd think, right, on the things that are cultivated inside of that. And so they've sort of been pushing back. And then yesterday, when we were teaching, they really broke through the perimeter. Uh, we knew they were coming, but they, um, our security was not up for the infiltration. And so these goats have now entered and are around and wreaking some havoc. And um, their worst offense has been um, doing some damage to this little young mango tree out there where they really gnawed away at the bark and hope we can heal it a little bit but you can see the it's like this oh this wild element has arisen and this uncertainty of how do we feel about it and then and, and then there's this way in which it feels like it's violated a space something that's mine something i care about something i protect and and then the the defenses go up the swords come out the oh the, how dare they you know have crossed this boundary into my uh, sacred garden <laughs> Hmm. And of course, this is from the, from my point of view, from their point of view, I'm just this mean old man, you know, clapping at them away from whatever might be bringing them joy, satisfaction and health even. Anytime you watch a, a few nature shows, you know, that, that comes to light. It's like you, you, we, we've learned to sympathize with the protagonist of the story. So there's, you know, a nature show on bunny rabbits and their little burrows and their families. And we, we come to 
so sympathize and care about them and um, desire for their well-being, you know, want their happiness and reproduction, you know. And then there's always in these shows, right, then there's the, the mountain lion like lurking in the background and they're the threat, you know, and they're the, they're the cause of the suffering and the hardship. We wanna be protected from them when they eat a rabbit, it's a tragedy. You know, we feel the pain of that. But then the next week we watch the show on the mountain lion and the mountain lion is the protagonist and this mother and her baby cubs are trying to make it through a winter and they're starving. And if they don't eat, if they don't find some rabbit to eat, you know, they're all gonna die. And so in that case, you're like, well, okay, <laughs> you're glad, you know, that these baby mountain lions are gonna make it through the winter. So how poignant that is, how painful to the sense of the spectrum of our care, of our well-wishing, of our um, compassion, our sympathies, our appreciations, how deeply bound up they are in who we identify with in any particular moment. You know, who we've, who we've become to feel are the worthy of our care. And those who are outside of it are the threats to our care. And the pain of that, you know, the, the limitation of heart of that. And yet the heart doesn't know um, how to respond. It, it doesn't understand that, that compassion and love and appreciation and equanimity are also part of the same uh, palette of heart qualities that are appropriate responses. So that actually feeling compassion in one moment doesn't actually exclude also the experience of equanimity, of understanding the natural world and of the cycles of samsara and um, that we are all involved in. Not only do they not exclude each other, but that the, the deepest compassion, the deepest love, the deepest appreciation require the deepest equanimity. Without the equanimity, they're still attached, they're still preference, they're still um, motivated by view and identification. And yet, of course, the heart doesn't always trust that process of, of more, of less identification, of less uh, evaluation of worthiness of our care. We're torn in our sense of who we care about and what does that mean in terms of practical action? You know, we go so quickly to the concern about, well, what do we do? Something has to be done. And one action will therefore must be a betrayal of one spiritual um, quality. But we say that we often get to that conclusion before we've actually tried to practice, tried to understand, the, the tensions and release and capacity of the heart. Of course, that, you know, and we are the, the central protagonist in our story that ultimately when it comes down to where our sympathies lie, um, more often than not, there we are going to be the the most uh, the first priority of our compassion. Not always, of course, we have questions of our worthiness, and and many of us, of course, find the ability to actually practice compassion for ourselves or practice loving kindness for ourselves to be, you know, very defended against. And maybe in our actions, we are always helping those, you know, others but we see that can be uh, equally imbalanced, right? That the sense of no one is more worthy nor less worthy of our affection, our care, our tenderness and our equanimity than ourselves. And that really is the, the direction these practices are intended to go. They are intended to break down the barrier. So the sense of selflessness is not self-harming, right? It is not a neglect of our own bodies, our own hearts, our own lives and livelihoods uh, for the sake of others. 
but it is breaking down the 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 tendency to build that sense of tension and barrier uh, wherever it might be conditioned to arise. It is interesting in the the uh, Visuddhi Magga talks about you know when we're practicing compassion, the first thing we should do is sit down and reflect upon the danger of a lack of compassion and the advantages, the benefits of practicing compassion. That's very important. You know, it's like we, we will focus in these intensive periods on the experience of non-conceptual uh, love, non-conceptual sympathy, non-conceptual awareness. But it doesn't mean that conceptual activity is not part of the process. It's very much this idea that it's central, right? To reflect upon, oh, what are the risks and dangers of not behaving with compassion toward ourselves, towards others in the world? What do we know happens when, when that behavior happens? What are the benefits of we see when we see compassion being the driving force between uh, an action in ourselves and relationship to others? And interestingly, they don't suggest starting, you know, in the, that traditional method of, of ourselves and the dear friend and the neutral person going to the enemy or the hostile person, that kind of progression that you'll see offered frequently with metta, love and kindness practice. Here, there is the idea of, of bringing to mind first someone who is in a state of misery, in a uh, wretched state, someone unlucky, <laughs> someone, um, someone who's having a hard time, but not like the dear person who's having a hard time. Uh, this idea of maybe someone by chance that we see or someone more distant. And then, and then secondly, the, the evildoer to be the next contemplation of our compassion. How interesting that is. And, and not putting them in the same category as like the hostile person or the enemy, but that, that sense of recognition that, that in their actions, in their harming, um, again, if it's a little more distant than us, out, than our sort of primary sphere, the sense that they are going to reap pain and, and hardship and sorrow from those actions. And that that might be in, in actually an easy way or a, a stable way to practice compassion or karuna, a sympathy for their hardship that we know is coming. Then they say to go to the benefactor or the, the dear person, the neutral. But also they'll say, don't, even if it's a good person, a person who you think is a good, decent person, but who has uh, come to ruin, you know, who, have, who they've lost a lot or they're in, in unwell, that you can practice compassion for them. But it can also be the good person who's doing fine. The good person who is, uh, has success and who seems to have what they need, that you can practice compassion for them. Because what's the quote? <laughs> Something like, because the yogi knows that they're really actually unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> which I love because it's very powerful. You know, uh, our, the monastic teacher at the Chazwa retreat in the last few years now, Sayadaw Panyananda, he would recount to us a story um, of how when he, they would ask their own teacher, Sayada Upandita, who you've heard many stories about how he was doing. Um, the, 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 the common answer in Burma as it would be here is, oh, fine, I'm doing well. I'm good, I'm good. But Sayadaw would always say something like, which means not bad, something like that, like not terrible. Uh, and, and at some point he explained to uh, you know, his senior monks and nuns that that really should be everyone's response because no one's really good. <laughs> if, he said, if you have a body, you're not good. 
you know, like you're actually never totally good, you know, and the yogis, you could see they hate hearing this. They're like, no, we are good. I'm good. I'm feeling good. And it's like, and this, this pointing, and it's like, it's sort of a Buddhist thing of like, yes, you're good. You're happy right now. Things are fine. But when those things change or little discomfort arises here or whatever, it's like that goodness is so fragile. Um, the relentlessness of experience is its own flavor of dukkha. Better to just say not bad. Right, that's just, it's a little more honest if you're actually watching, not bad. You know, even if things feel well, feel like you have what you need and things are, are substantial, also pointing to the, the tension when we have enough, when we feel secure in our belongings, in our, uh, all the ways that we develop security through greed, hatred, or delusion, or, or just through accumulation, that there is the fear that we will lose it. Right? There's a concern about the people we love. There's a concern about the things we have. And that is a kind that is a very much a kind of dukkha. It's a kind of anxiety, a kind of stress. So the sense of you can practice compassion even for someone who's doing well. Think about that. Try that out sometime because really you know they're not that happy. <laughs> uh, maybe we don't always like to feel that cynical. For some of us who are more cynical, that's like a wonderful way to practice compassion. Because you know on some level, right, that it's like, he seems good, but you know underneath it, there's like some real dukkha, you know, and that's actually beautiful. It's important to recognize that actually all humans are suffering. All beings are suffering on some level. It is something that binds us. And again, it starts to break down these barriers between ourselves and others of like, oh, they have this and I have that and I wish I had this or we, they wish they had that or more than, less than, equal to, all of that stuff. It's like, dukkha, 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 dukkha. There is a body. It's out of control. It's, it's undependable. It's unpredictable. There's dukkha. There's a mind that is sensitive to all these sense experiences, hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting. That is dukkha, right? It is like this, the bombardment of experience. It's a kind of dukkha. One of my favorite books ever was is a book called um, You Can't Win. It was written by a guy named Jack Black, not the comedian. Um, so it was in the uh, kind of late 1800s, early 1900s. And it's an autobiographical story of um, his life as a, starting from a young, you know, teenager through most of his life of, kind of living the life of a, a hobo and a pickpocket and a, becoming like a real criminal and, and thief. And it is this amazing experience of, of, of following the trajectory of someone from their childhood through their life. And you buy, you, you, again, he's a protagonist and you sympathize with him. You like his sense of humor. You appreciate his insightfulness. And all the while he's really harming people, right? He's really like making so many people's lives unstable and, and difficult. And as much as one might like him as a character, you wouldn't want to have your things stolen by him. You wouldn't want him in your house, creeping around, grabbing your things at night. But he talks about uh, at various points, this reckoning that he ultimately had to come to with his actions. When I first began stealing, I had but a dim realization of its wrong. I accepted it as a thing to do because it was done by the people I was with. Besides, it was adventurous and thrilling. Later, it became an everyday cold-blooded business, and I went about it methodically, accepting the dangers and privations it entailed. I was fully aware of the gravity of my offenses. Every time I stole a dollar, I knew I was breaking a law and working a hardship on the loser. Yet for years, I kept on doing it. I wonder how many of us quit wrongdoing others for the best reason of all, because it's wrong and we know it. Any thief that can't or doesn't put himself in the victim's place, in the place of the copper that pinches him, or in the place of the judge who sentences him, is not a complete thief. His narrow-mindedness will prevent him from doing his best work and also shut him off from opportunities to help and protect himself when he is laid by the heels. 
Nobody wants to live and die a criminal. They all hope to quit someday, usually when it's almost too late. I will say right here to any thief who thinks of quitting that, he can, that if he can put himself in the other fellow's place, he has something substantial to start on. And if he can't do it, he'll never get anywhere. There's a very powerful, famous story of um, Angulimala, you know, in the uh, in the suttas and the texts of who is another, you know, really evil doer, much worse than Jack Black and <laughs> most people you could even imagine, right? A real a thief, a robber, a bandit, a murderer. And it's a beautiful story, uh, which I won't go into all of around his his transformation of, of again, you know, it's like hitting this place of understanding how painful it is to harm, and wanting to be free from that. Want, seeing the vision of the Buddha, seeing seeing the possibility of of that unburdened heart, and how uh, powerful an impact that was, and the desire to be free. And so he began this journey of um, transformation, of, of trying to follow this path and practice these practices, but but came upon real hardship in in the sense in the form of remorse for his actions. He couldn't concentrate. He was plagued by the results of his actions, what he had done. And it wasn't until he was able to profoundly feel the sympathy of another person suffering, a woman in the village who he came to their house and found that she was having difficulty in childbirth, overwhelmed in the face of this suffering, that he got in touch with the deeper motivation for his own goodness and the deeper truth of his own goodness and, and where he could lay claim to his goodness. Even if he had done all of these past actions, he, he knew that for a certain period of time, he hadn't harmed, he hadn't done any, and his aspiration to be enlightened, awakened, gentle, compassionate, caring. And was able to stand on that to offer that generosity of heart, offer that kindness in a way that proved miraculous uh, and uh, allowed for the birth to be um, successful and the child was healthy and the mother was healthy. And it allowed his heart to open to his own sense of goodness and ultimately to free itself from the bondage of greed, hatred, and delusion to understand the, the deeper security in the letting go, in the non-contraction, in the letting go of self, in the letting go of the stability that we seek in greed and miserliness, uh, in anger and worry and fear. We can't just think of those things as wickedness. We need to understand that all of those qualities of the heart, all of the worry of the anxiety, it's like, it's ultimately, it's trying to protect you. You know, sometimes you have, you know what you're worried about. You know that that's like, oh, this thing is happening and I'm anxious about it. I'm anxious about the future. But there are times where the, the anxiety, the tension, is, it's not clear what the story is, what the object is, what the sadness is about. We have to remember that it doesn't matter most of the time. It's, it's the deeper truth that there is instability, there is insecurity. And that sadness, the anxiety, the worry, that tension, the anger, you know, it builds because there's something that is threatened that we feel our love isn't strong enough to feel protected in. Our wisdom isn't strong enough to feel protected in that truth. The equanimity isn't strong enough. The mindfulness isn't strong enough. And so we can 
bo do both, right? It's like, to, and to, to really get when we're angry about something, it again, it's not just, it's not wickedness in the heart. We shouldn't give ourselves a hard time about it. We can always see that something we care about has been threatened. Something we care about has been harmed, right? It starts with care. And yet that care isn't stable. We don't trust it enough. It isn't developed enough. It isn't, you know, we, we just aren't there yet to feel like we can stay stable in the caring or that the harm happens and then the care can flip to compassion, can flip to equanimity to understand, okay, this is true. This is the, this is the way things are. Life is like this. I can still care. I can still act. I can create a healthy boundary where I need to. I can do whatever I need to do to try to alleviate the conditions that led to this. But when the heart doesn't have that versatility, when something we care about is harmed or threatened, we don't have the ability to say, oh, that love, let's turn it to compassion. Let's feel that care for the harm. Let's feel like the care for the, the, the mind that caused the harm because we know it's suffering. We know that this wouldn't happen if it was a mind that was uh, alleviated from suffering. Uh, we just haven't developed that fluidity, that versatility, that dexterity of mind, that's all. And so we understand, oh, the care, we understand the worry, we understand the anger and the rage. Oh, of course we're angry. The love didn't feel strong enough. The compassion wasn't available. The equanimity wasn't there, so there's rage. There's fury, there's fear. And the beauty is, is those are all equal entry points back into it. Oh, we can care about fear. We can care about worry. We can care about anxiety. We can care about anger. We can accept the nature of it. Oh yeah, with these conditions and this training and this these habits of our past, of course this arises. Of course we're not, we know we're not fully beyond it. And then if we actually harm someone, if we, if we do have so little control over it that we say something harmful, we, we do something harmful with our physical actions, we think something um, cruel with our mind, then there's that sense of, oh, remorse, right? Healthy, healthy remorse, healthy understanding of, oh, wow, this was unskillful, not in denial of that, but trying to repair as soon as we can trying to create um, as much sense of safety for who we may have harmed as we can, understand our own failings as well as we can and, and come to understand, come to try to be better, not wanting to feel that remorse, that pain of wishing we hadn't harmed. Our own suffering can be the cause and inspiration for our liberation, but also the suffering of others. very hard you know to 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 have various things we care about and there's a dynamic tension between them oh we care about this and we care about this but they they feel incongruent i care about these goats i care about my mango tree uh you know how can how can the heart hold caring about both and we need to trust that it can, you know, that there are ways of, of practicing within that tension, that the answer isn't always about like, well, here's the way out, here's the activity to do that serves one or not the other. And there may not be the perfect activity, but there is the balance of heart that can come, right? There is the ability, it's like, like I've said, you know, again, it's raining here in the desert, so rare. And that recognition that the rain, the rain is unconditional in where it falls, right? The rain falls on the goat as much as the mango tree, as much as me, as much as the halikoa, you know, as much as whatever. The sun shines on all of it. The, these elemental truths of the way things are, our heart can be like that. Our heart has the ability to offer its love and kindness, irregardless, regardless of condition, regardless of preference or identity. And it does uh, phenomenal work at starting to break down those barriers, right? Rub away the distinction between us and them, between me and the goat, me and you, whatever it is. So when the distinctions and the barriers come up, we understand them, we accept them, 
we feel care for the pain of that tension. And then of course we aspire to a deepening, broadening capacity to care, love and kindness, to care about all beings equally, to care about the suffering of all beings equally, to care about the joy of all beings equally, and to accept the reality and the truth of what is unfolding accept our karma, accept reality equally. Let's just sit for a moment. Thank you for joining us. If you are just here for the Sunday sitting, um, wonderful to share, you know, this beautiful sense of uh, compassion that has been building over the weekend. This this warmth of heart that I feel like we are abiding in, um, and all its edges, of course. Um, but it's been wonderful to have uh, a larger group in the space for the time. We hope you can join us uh, next weekend again, either for the weekend retreat or just for the Sunday sitting. And um, for those of you who are continuing on with the, the weekend retreat, uh, we'll see you in a little while for the metta chanting and sitting. Okay. And for be those well. of you, and those of you who are out in the world, um, we're sending you much metta <laughs> for the next day, <laughs> all of us. <laughs>